Hi, I'm David Peterson, the creator of Mouse Guard, and this is Creator Commentary for the extras in the Mouse Guard Fall 1152 hardcover. As I go through this commentary, please feel free to follow along in your copy of the book as I talk about the behind-the-scenes details, art notes, and my headspace as I go through the extras created to collect issues 1 through 6 into this edition. I was working on the extras for the hardcover release of Mouse Guard in the early months of 2007, and the book was released just before my 30th birthday. I'd never done a book design as complicated as a 92-page hardcover, but Mark Smiley, who ran Archaea in those days, was gracious enough to not just do the design and tell me what he needed, but to walk me through the process so I could make meaningful decisions as we designed the book together. Jacket Cover I was originally going to do something more like the first edition role-playing game cover with all the characters facing the reader, and toyed with the idea also of watercoloring it. This is back when I was working on issue 5 in Baltimore, Maryland. I was with Mark Smiley, and he suggested I should do something more representative of the story inside of the book. As soon as he said it, I was amazed I had been dumb enough to think of pursuing something different. For the jacket, I focused on the main trio under fall leaves to reinforce the title of the book. Another little story point is Saxon is discovering the grain pieces. On the back cover, Midnight is raising the axe with his army behind him. I had to sum up this series into a single image another time when I did the Mouse Guard Fall 1152 poster for Mondo. There again, I used the main trio, though I put Liam in front, as well as the leaves but included the snake behind them, something I think I considered for the jacket cover, just perhaps in shadowy snake scale. Midnight and his army were also included on the poster, though as an inset panel instead of a back cover. End papers. End papers are the paper that glue to the inside face of the cover and then continue to the right, or left if it's the back cover, as the very first page you see with the cover opened. I didn't know what endpapers were by name until Mark Smiley and I were going over the book design. I'm not sure which of us suggested it, but we opted to use the line art on faux parchment for the map found later in the extras section for the endpapers. It's become a tradition for almost all Mouse Guard hardcovers to have the map for that series also as the endpapers in the hardcover collection. Title page. With space to fill here, I wanted to have an illustration that didn't compete with the text of the title and dedication, but still filled the space enough. Saxon running through and swiping his sword at the fall leaves so they cascade onto the next page felt like a good way to solve my problem and also reinforce the fall leaf motif, something that visually was absent through most of the fall series until the last few issues. The Dedication like almost all the Mouse Guard books, is to my wife, Julia, because I know I couldn't have gotten past drawing that first issue, let alone the whole book, without her. I'd also lost my paternal grandparents recently enough, my grandfather in 2003, the year Julia and I were married, and my grandmother in 2005, soon after I had the deal with Archaea, but before the series had any national recognition. They were very special people, and I know everyone says that about their grandparents but it seems especially true in my case. Spot illustrations. To separate the various sections of the book, I drew three tall panels of nature scenes. The first one is found opposite the contents page of a bare thicket shrub. It's rather detailless, just overlapping lines of branches, but in color, and all color held to further evoke the autumn feel of the book. The tree fungus illustration appears opposite the page announcing the epilogue. It was my chance to revisit those steps Kalanaw climbed in issue 4. I love that these fungus are a cool visual, but in the context of a book about mice, they take on a new function and beauty when at mouse scale. Lastly, the fall leaves illustration appears opposite the page announcing the maps, guides, and assorted extras. I'm not happy with this illustration. I think I tried to be too clever in inking and cross-hatching in the negative space between the leaves but I think the eye tends to gravitate towards those negative spaces and misses the overall shape of the leaves that I was going for. Epilogue Mark Smiley felt the ending to issue 6 was a little abrupt, 
and as we had room in the hardcover, he suggested, and I agreed, that I could soften that ending a bit with an epilogue. Panel 1 is meant to emulate the first panel of all the issues in fall, to act like a Japanese woodblock nature image, framing the title. Though, we didn't put the word epilogue here by the time we got around to the final book design layout. The font for Gwendolyn's narration here is virtually unreadable. I've avoided changing it in subsequent reprints for fear of slipping down a slope of needing to keep tweaking and changing past works. But seeing and studying it again for this video has convinced me that I will change it in a future printing. Since Gwendolyn is an important figure in the guard, she needed to have more screen time. Having her narrate the epilogue as a journal entry not only has her in the opening page, but continues her voice throughout the epilogue. The visuals for this page are all of fall turning to winter, frost on the grass and leaves, on the window panes, and a glow from the fireplace. Page 2. This page was my way to deal with the questions of what happened to Midnight's army. The mice of Midnight's army left outside of Lock Haven were not killed by the bees, though, come on, some had to, right? But they went back to their lives. So I depicted a few daily routines of common mice harvesting and candle making. My layout for the last panel was originally of a mouse setting a table with their family coming in the door, and a cupboard door opened just enough that we, the viewer, could see, but the family could not, and that inside of that cupboard would be some armor hanging. Instead, I decided to show the building where the three mice listed in the narration were imprisoned, while two wounded mice bury their armor. I don't know that the jail aspect of that structure is readable, or if it looks more like the two mice in the foreground are two-thirds of the prisoners mentioned in the dialogue here, but it makes me wonder if my original idea for the table-setting sequence would have been a better one. Page 3. Rand's page. Another mouse who needed more screen time. In panel 1, I got to showcase a healer at work, using bandages and herbs to dress Rand's wound something that comes up in the winter book. And in panels two through four, I establish his retirement from patrolling and his permanent home of Lockhaven as the defense expert. The last panel was inspired by the part in Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame when Frollo is singing to Quasimodo that he will obey and stay in here as he places a carved quasi figurine inside the Notre Dame model. Rand of Yellow Cloak will stay at Lockhaven. Page 4. Sadie's Page. In the first panel, I wanted to add, or at least reinforce, a little more background about her being stationed at Frostic, alone and isolated prior to the events of Fall. Panel 2 was to concretely establish that Conrad was dead. I was seeing messages online and hearing from fans that they thought perhaps Conrad had survived. This panel was my way of describing Sadie's sorrow while also setting the record straight with the fans about Conrad's fate. The visual for the panel is an homage to Guy Davis's BPRD Plague of Frogs number no. 5 cover, where Abe Sapien is harpooned. If you've listened to the commentary for issue 2 of Fall, you'll understand the connection. In panel 3, that row of doors is supposed to be some type of dormitory row for patrol mice returning to Lock Haven for short stays. Not sure if that's how I'll depict it, when, or if I ever need to show it again, but it's a good place to start. Page 5. Sadie joining Saxon and Kenzie in the Lockhaven casks. This marks the first appearance of the mouse board game Swords and Strongholds. I wanted to have Saxon and Kenzie unwinding with a board game, and I drew something that had pawns that sat on the intersection points of a grid and some cards... I had no idea how the game was played or how it was won. When the game reappears again in Legends of the Guard Volume 1, I had built myself a model board and pawns so that I could keep the size of the grid on the board consistent as well as the shape and size of the pawns. It wouldn't be until after Volume 2 of Legends of the Guard that Luke Crane and I designed rules for that game and kickstarted it into a real product. Page 6 with the epilogue being a place to showcase more downtime and low-key activities of writing, castle repair, candle making, harvesting, drinking, and playing board games, it felt right to include mending of cloaks and sharpening of blades. 
My plan for Liam and Kalanos tale in winter, I don't think was fully cemented when I wrote and drew this page. I just knew that, one, Liam hadn't met Kellanon on any of the issue's pages, so it seemed like a good time to establish that they now have been introduced before the winter book started. And two, that as a character, Liam has outgrown Saxon and Kenzie as his mentors. And that who would be a better mentor for the emerging main character hero Liam became in this book other than the Obi-Wan of Mice, Kellanon, the Black Axe. The room in panel two was based on a treehouse I saw in an Architectural Homes magazine. The loft up top also has beds for two mice. This is the visual I have in mind for the housing when mice are joining the guard, but in that year-plus-long training session of first doing nothing but service work inside of Lock Haven, and then later being mentored by a patrol guard or a patrol leader for patrol work. Again, if I ever get around to telling a story that needs it, this will be a good place to start. Page 7. To sum up the questions still surrounding Kellen on the axe, I had Gwendolyn tie them up in a bow over the course of these pages. Those questions may not be answered, but they are accepted as being unanswered. The architectural whereabouts of Kellen on this page is the secret passage Midnight found saying he had proof the black axe was real. It is also essentially part of the secret passage Kellen on, Saxon, and Kenzie used to get up into Gwendolyn's office and is the passage I not only show again in the winter epilogue, but make a point of its purpose in the third book, The Black Axe. On the shelves in panel three are a bronze sculpture of a mouse I made in college, Ferrer's hammer that forged the axe, a piece of weasel tile from Dark Heather, and a book with the Archaea logo. The book Kellanaw is holding is not only open to one of the illuminated pages from issue five, but that we find out in book three of the Mouse Guard series that this is in fact M's book of the history of the Black Axe. Page eight. Back to Gwendolyn wrapping up the narrative about the life of a guard being one of little rest. The second panel shows Lockhaven's larder, something I built a model for and will have a video up for soon. I was trying to establish that it's rare for guard patrols to go out much in winter, but in this case, the harvest had been interrupted in some way by Midnight's Rebellion, though it seems like not enough time passes in the book for that really to be the case, but go with me. This is pure setup for the next volume, Winter 1152. Map. This map is the first definitive version of the map I had been hand-drawing over and over throughout the series for the backgrounds. I started with an old map, one that was slightly distorted, of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. I then started tracing over it, making modifications and alterations as I went. As a reference point, Caligaro is about where Whitefish Point is. I gave many of the city names some type of significance to my beloved home state of Michigan. Woodruff's Grove is the name of the town where I went to Eastern Michigan University before it was renamed to Ypsilanti, long before my time though. Ferndale, the name of the city where Julia and I ended up settling. White Pine, the name of a historic village outside of Ludington, Michigan, where I vacationed and camped as a kid. Dawn Rock references the city and rock Petoskey. The fossil pattern on that stone got the name from an Indian chief whose name has something to do with sun rays. So, sun on the stone. Petoskey, or Dawn Rock. Ironwood. There is an Ironwood, Michigan, though I have no specific connection there. Just that the name already felt very mouse guardy. Grass Lake is another one of those. Apple Loft, a reference to the C.S. Mott estate in Flint, Michigan that's actually called Apple Wood. Frostic, named after Michigan wildlife lover, poet, and printmaker Gwen Frostic. Lone Pine, the name of a road very close to Julia's aunt and uncle's house. Flint Rust. Well, okay, here I took a little shot at my hometown for being slightly past its glory days and having a bit of a tarnish to own up to. But this was all pre-water crisis. I do love my hometown and have no problem with a little bit of rust on her. Oak Grove. It's the same name as a sanitarium long gone in Flint, Michigan, that was eventually replaced by my high school, Flint Central. Oak Grove wasn't a single building. It was a network of buildings and it was connected underground by tunnels. 
Not all of the buildings were torn down to make room for the high school. In fact, when my mother attended Flint Central in the 50s, she had a sewing or a typing class in one of the old buildings. By the time I attended the school, all of those buildings were long gone. But rumors abounded about secret passageways and tunnels that led to old basements of the buildings unfilled in. I've long been intrigued by the place and collected old photos of it in its heyday, as well as some of the china that it used for serving. After all, why shouldn't I be interested? Technically, it is my alma mater. Dory Gift and Gill Pledge My grandparents that I dedicated the book in memory of were Doris, which means God's gift, and Gilbert, which means Bright Pledge. Another city name note, as I mentioned in the issue 3 commentary, I had forgotten when compiling and making up all the names to include for this map, Wind's Elm, which is referenced by Midnight in that issue. Luckily, I dated the map a few years before this story took place, so I could retcon in an excuse that the town was founded after this map was surveyed. Barkstone. Looking back at the two-page spread of Barkstone now, I'm a little underwhelmed. Granted, it was my first time ever drawing a city in whole or exploring architectural cutaways. While this isn't technically a cutaway, we are inside the stone cavern and tree hollow towards the merchant alley of the locust tree that Barkstone resides in. To be able to draw the city, I found several printable paper model kits of medieval cottages, barns, and homes. As I scaled them all to roughly match each other, as they were from different sources and in different sizes, Julia would cut and assemble them as they came off the printer. Together we made about 14 or 15 of them. I cleared a space on a large table in my studio and put my digital camera on a tripod, and then set up a cluster of them, grouping all of the models at one end of the table, and snap a picture. After that picture was taken, I'd place toothpicks around the perimeter of the area the buildings were, and then I could pick up all the paper models and rearrange them, sometimes even stacking a few, in the area beyond the toothpick perimeter. I would repeat that process until I got all the way across the table. In Photoshop, I could then assemble all those photos together and use it for perspective and geometry reference for drawing Barkstone. In the drawing, I had to add my own details to those buildings so that they didn't repeat over and over. And I also had to modify some of the buildings in the drawing, so I could incorporate some of the buildings already drawn in the third issue. Most of those are near the upper left corner of the image in the merchant alley, and over in the lower right corner near the well. The mayoral home is based on a real place. It was my Materials Unlimited manager's historic home in Detroit that he and his partner were restoring when I first was working on Mouse Guard. Unfortunately, as I was working on these extras after his partner's passing, he no longer was able to keep the home. But as someone who spent a lot of hours there on weekends helping his boss, painting, sanding, hauling, and landscaping, I can say that it was an amazingly beautiful and charming place, and I wanted to include it in my book. To help answer some questions in my head about the sky-like background in issue 3, I drew in an excuse and made some labels to depict that the ceiling is painted a light color to help reflect whatever light is inside that place, and that vent holes bring Barkstone some fresh air. I tried to incorporate all the versions and subsections of Lock Haven I'd drawn during the series into this piece, including Gwendolyn's office tower and the beehive vents. Covering the structure in ivy also helped me not to have to figure out every bit of architecture, and it solved some of the issues of how to keep predators out of open spaces. Because I had a lot of information that I thought important to share about the home of the guard, I opted to make this two-page spread almost more of a half-infographic rather than a full literal illustration of Lockhaven and the rooms inside. The main text was by way of clarifying some things that I had seen misunderstood about Lockhaven and reviews and message boards or fans talking to me at conventions. Lockhaven isn't a city with average citizens was something I thought important to clarify. When Luke Crane and I started work on the RPG a few years later, and I had to answer, how does a mouse become a guard, is when I really did figure out how Lockhaven fully functions. Some mice, who are guard mice, never are out on patrol or in open country, but rather are bakers, weavers, apiarists, metalsmiths, 
gatekeepers, washers, etc. They may have been patrol mice like Rand, who now have duties more suited to them after age or injury, or perhaps recruits who were never quite up to snuff or found more fulfillment being of service to the guard as a whole. The weapons and armor icon here is also seen outside of the weaponsmith's room in issue 6, and it became the logo for the Mouse Guard line of Revelica weapons at Skeleton Crew Studio. Similarly, the weighted loom image in the textiles box became the logo on the tags of the plush mice from Skeleton Crew. The information in this section states the importance of a guard's cloak. In my head, it was the primary symbol of a guard mouse, and that possibly even something about the weave was distinctly recognizable from being just a common mouse's blanket. With Lockhaven being part home, part shelter, the food stores need to focus on lasting staples. When I wrote about the Gab Kroon bread that's listed here, I was imagining a mousy version of Lembus bread from The Lord of the Rings, but I wanted it to sound more appealing. The word Gab Kroon is an anagram of Congo Bar, a blondie type brownie that my grandmother used to make. It popped into my head as I was writing the content for this section. While I imagine Gab Kroon to be almost more like a scone than a brownie, the name stuck as an homage to her baking. Several fans have made up their own Gab Kroon recipes, and I hope to be sharing at least one soon. Trades. When all was completed on my end with the extras for the fall volume, we somehow still had two pages in the book's page count to fill. Mark Smiley suggested something like the spot illustrations in Gnomes, illustrated by Rin Portflit, but instead showing mouse daily life or tasks. Many of these were inspired by my childhood visits to working historic towns like Greenfield Village in Dearborn, Michigan, Crossroads Village in Flint, Michigan, Fort Mackinac, Colonial Williamsburg, White Pine Village outside of Ludington, Michigan, and a few others. The ads that the carpenter is using is one of those old and mostly outdated tools that somehow I grew up with a working knowledge of because my dad had one and cared about woodworking techniques. The peg system to keep that timber in place as the mouse swings it was my own invention, and while I'm proud of it, I'm rather less proud of the angles and geometry making that swing impossible without either damaging that beam, the bench, or the mouse themselves. When I've drawn other stonemasons and bakers for mouse guard or for single illustrations, I tend to go back to these two designs and include a scarf or neckerchief for the masons and a similar hat like this for the bakers. Example D in the pottery was a combination of two items in our family combined into a single design. My grandmother had a craftsman-style ceramic tall coffee pot-like pitcher with the same glaze that I inherited after her death. But instead here I made it low and squat like a teapot, and then I added a wire-wrapped driftwood handle to mimic a frequently used cooking pot lid my dad improvised on a camping trip when the old handle had broken off. These extras, their placement, and their page counts not only improved fall as a collection, in my opinion, but they formed a template for how to dress out the future volumes of Mouse Guard, getting to explore more seasonal or thematic illustrations, mouse trades and ways of life, maps, and location guides and cutaways. That wraps up the last commentary for Mouse Guard Fall 1152. If you've enjoyed this commentary, please leave your comments in the section below. Let me know what I didn't answer for you from this volume. And subscribe for updates when I add more Mouse Guard commentary for the other volumes. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.